All right, well, the Young Turks, we've got a great, great show ahead for you. we got a little stories. we got big stories. A lot of big ones, and I make a lot of little ones. And uh, all that's coming up. Look, in the third hour, uh, we have a ridiculous set of interviews for you guys. Buckle up. If you like progressives, we got David Sirota on the program for you. And he ain't playing. And he's got some very interesting ideas about General McChrystal and what went wrong here. Okay? Uh, well, if you like independent, centrist, moderates, corporatists, I mean moderates, uh, we have one of those two. And boy, am I going to disagree with him. Now, I like the guy, but that might get heated. So let's, let's see how that turns out. Okay? And then number three, Johnny Knoxville from Jackass on the program today. Who does a show like this? Who? Who? My guess is no one. All right. Now, um, what are we going to start with? <laughs> Everybody, we're still having this conversation? Is that what's happening? Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yeah. Down goes McChrystal. Down goes McChrystal. Um, uh, apparently, Barack Obama had had enough of uh, General McChrystal uh, mouthing off, right? And he's uh, down and out. So uh, it's interesting, right? Because the first we'd set up this question of, look, last night, is Obama going to take him down or is he not? And if uh, some actually were on the side of some strong progressives on the side of saying, no, he shouldn't. Uh, in fact, uh, Keith Overman came out with a, a, a little spiel saying that why it would be a bad idea to take down McChrystal. Don't give the Republicans any cause, la, 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 la. No, no, no. I saw that and I was like, totally wrong. Sad day. Sometimes we disagree, okay? No, you got to take him down. If you don't, it's fundamental and unacceptable weakness. So, but Obama passed the test. He did take him down. So that, that's a result. I'm going to get to Obama in a second. So, before I get to Obama and his reaction to McChrystal, look, let me just lay this marker out for you. You ain't heard the last of McChrystal. That dude is coming back. Okay? I mean, that was a bizarre way to go out. I, it, like I told you yesterday, they double and triple checked with him to make sure that they could run that story and that the quotes were accurate. And they all, McChrystal and all of his aides said, yes, those quotes are accurate. Go ahead and run with it. That means they did this on purpose. I mean, that's a weird thing to do on purpose. A couple of reasons why it might have happened. One, they pulled the trigger. They thought, we can't win this. We've got to get out of here, right? And McChrystal isn't about to turn around and tell the American people or the president, hey, you know what? That uh, plan I sold you was a, <laughs> was a bag of goods. Is that what they call it? I don't know what they call it. That. What do they call it? A bag of something, isn't it? Pile of goods? No. <laughs> uh, but it... It isn't what I told you, and it ain't going to work. Now, part of the reason I tell you that, and I think that, is because if you read the whole Rolling Stone article, over and over, his aides say, yeah, this doesn't really look winnable, uh, and if the American people really knew what was going on, they'd be much more against this war. Okay? And that's McChrystal's guys. But that alone isn't going to do it. I mean, it's a weird political uh, career Harry Carey to pull. Uh, it seems like this guy's up to no good. Because, remember, this was a guy described uh, as Rumsfeld and George Bush's golden boy. And he's the guy that uh, looked the other way as they did detainee ab abuse in, in Iraq in 2006. He's the one that doctored the Tillman report and told the president, hey, I doctored it, make sure, now he didn't say it in that many words, but he said, make sure you don't talk about how Tillman died, because that could be embarrassing later. Wink, wink and got a promotion nine days later from Bush. Okay, So th this, is, this is a guy who's neck deep in Republican politics okay? and, and being conservative. Now, he claims he voted for Obama. <laughs> good one, not a good one. Okay. As Obama's about to become his commander-in-chief, that's a nice little political move for McChrystal to, to pull. I don't, no one even asked him. He just kind of dropped it out there. right? So... Now, will the Republicans turn on this? Oh, you better believe it. Now, for the moment being, we, John McCain and some of the other top Republicans said, hey, this is insubordination, can't have it, right? Just give them time. It won't take long. They will turn, and they'll say, how could Obama put his own petty, you know, grievances and personal issues with McChrystal above our mission? 
The only man who could have run this mission is the legendary McChrystal. And I can't believe Obama threw him under the bus because he felt offended. It's coming. It's coming. I guarantee it. Okay, It might be coming later in today's program. So now when they do that, uh, all of a sudden McChrystal is going to be a conservative hero. Look, I I'm telling you the future right now. Okay, I tell it now. You hear me now. Quote me later. Okay, so then is he going to turn around and go, I'll tell you what, man, I was winning that Afghanistan war, but you no, know, this Obama guy, he screwed it up, and then, you know, he goes and gets all offended and, you know, and fires me. Eh, you know, there is an alternative. You can go with me. I got nunchucks. You know those nunchucks he carries around that's got four stars in his name on it? Who puts their name on nunchucks? I mean, some folks do, but they've got issues, you know. <laughs> they... You know the kind of guy who puts his name on nunchucks is the kind of guy who can't wait to use them. Like, give him any excuse. Like, you took my pencil. Damn, you just broke four fingers of mine. What the hell's the matter with you, you psycho? I mean, that's the kind of guy we're dealing with in McChrystal because that's a psychotic move. Even the reporter who wrote the Rolling Stone article said it was recklessness. He said, I don't know why he gave me that kind of access. I don't know why he told me all those things. There's something up there, man. Something doesn't smell right. And what doesn't smell right is going to float right back around to us. It's a Young Turks guarantee. All right, let's see what happens. Now, let's go to President Obama's reaction. Uh, first, he's got nothing but kind words for McChrystal. Let's go to clip number one. Today I accepted General Stanley McChrystal's resignation as commander of the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. I did so with considerable regret but also with certainty that it is the right thing for our mission in Afghanistan, for our military, and for our country. I'm also pleased to nominate General David Petraeus to take command in Afghanistan, which will allow us to maintain the momentum and leadership that we need to succeed. I don't make this decision based on any difference in policy with General McChrystal, as we are in full agreement about our strategy. Nor do I make this decision out of any sense of personal insult. Stan McChrystal has always shown great courtesy and carried out my orders faithfully. I've got great admiration for him and for his long record of service in uniform. Over the last nine years, with America fighting wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, he has earned a reputation as one of our nation's finest soldiers. I got nothing but love for him. We did a man hug earlier. That guy is awesome. He's got nunchucks. Well, then why'd you fire the guy? <laughs> What's going to calm down with the man love? You just fired the dude. Now, you could tell Biden's behind him. Biden's like, let me have at him, man. Because Biden took the heaviest hits from that Rolling Stone piece. I can just see him, like, jumping in there going, oh. Yeah, what happened now, McChrystal? Oh, oh. Who, who's saying, bite me now? Right? And then um, <laughs> Obama with the flowing praise. He's like, he's always a, a man who's always showed great courtesy to me. Except for that time that he threw me under the bus in that Rolling Stone article for which I fired him. And the other time when he put me in a really bad spot by leaking his recommendations to the press and making me, <laughs> you know, pressuring me to agree with him on troop increase. Uh, other than that, though, he's just been a doll. <laughs> okay, so all right, so Barack, why'd you fire him? Clip number two. My multiple responsibilities as Commander-in-Chief led me to this decision. First, I have a responsibility to the extraordinary men and women who are fighting this war and to the democratic institutions that I've been elected to lead. I've got no greater honor than serving as Commander-in-Chief of our men and women in uniform. And it is my duty to ensure that no diversion complicates the vital mission that they are carrying out. That includes adherence to a strict code of conduct. The strength and greatness of our military is rooted in the fact that this code applies equally to newly enlisted privates and to the general officer who commands them. It is also true that our democracy depends upon institutions that are stronger than individuals. That includes strict adherence to the military chain of command 
and respect for civilian control over that chain of command. And that's why, as Commander-in-Chief, I believe this decision is necessary to, s to hold ourselves accountable to standards that are at the core of our democracy. Second, I have a responsibility to do what is, whatever is necessary to succeed in Afghanistan and in our broader effort to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat al-Qaeda. I believe that this mission demands unity of effort across our alliance and across my national security team. And I don't think that we can sustain that unity of effort and achieve our objectives in Afghanistan without making this change. That, too, has guided my decision. I've just told my national security team that now is the time for all of us to come together. Doing so is not an option, but an obligation. I welcome debate among my team, but I won't tolerate division. Man, this guy takes a while getting to what he's saying. Man, it's just look, here is how I would have handled it. The dude's going to talk smack like that. I had to show him my pimp hand. I mean, <laughs> that guy is gone, man. It's, his career is, in the immortal words of Spike Lee, OVA, O V A H. Okay, of course you can't say stuff like that. Man, Obama's so careful. Anyway, all right, bless his heart. He's careful. He's a politician. He did what he did. So now, uh, luckily, the guy who's going to replace him is going to be awesome. Totally new direction. We're not going to have that smack anymore, okay? That's crazy talk, right? So the guy who's going to replace him is, of course, the guy who picked him, David Petraeus. Interesting. All right, let's go to Barack Obama, clip number three. Now, General Petraeus and I were able to spend some time this morning discussing the way forward. I'm extraordinarily grateful that he has agreed to serve in this new capacity. It should be clear to everybody he does so at great personal sacrifice to himself and to his family. And he is setting an extraordinary example of service and patriotism by assuming this difficult post. Let me say to the American people, this is a change in personnel, but it is not a change in policy. General Petraeus fully participated in our review last fall, and he both supported and helped design the strategy that we have in place. All right, now understand, Petraeus was in charge of Afghanistan and Iraq. He was McChrystal's boss. He's the guy who said, oh, McChrystal's a brilliant idea. So then Obama sits down, he's like, who am I going to replace him with? Should I get a guy who's, you know, on board, understands what's going on, et cetera, is on my team, not their team? Because remember, Petraeus and McChrystal were beloved by Bush and Cheney, right? So he sits down with uh, uh, Petraeus. I almost called him Cheney. You know why? Because he pulled a Cheney. He's like, so who do you think should be, uh, get that new assignment? Petraeus is like, I don't know, look. How about me? He's like, okay, done, deal. You're extraordinary. And then comes out and gives a flowery speech about it. Look, this is not really what I would have done because you can't do this as president, but let's have a little bit of fun. So I come out, first I show McChrystal my pimp hand, then next I would have been like, look, for the moment being, I went with this dude right here, Petraeus, okay? Because I don't have a lot of options and he knows what's going on over there and you guys are going to be all over my ass if I don't pick him, right? And the Republicans, blah, 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 blah. Oh, you know what? Rewind. If it was me, I'd have picked somebody else. Okay, but assuming I had to go with Petraeus, I'd be like, and I told him, uh, this is your last warning. That was your boy, and he screwed up how many times? And I've seen you in front of Congress saying, oh, yeah, but Obama's deadline, not necessarily a deadline. If I don't like it, I'm going to keep more troops in there. Well, that's not how it's going to go. And the minute I hear another word out of this son of a bitch, he's gone too. Who's next? Who's next? Can you imagine? Well, with Obama, of course you can't imagine. That's not going to happen, right? So, uh, but you know what? One last one here, clip number four. Uh, parting shot to McChrystal. He's really going to let him have it. Go get him, Barack. Let me conclude by saying that it was a difficult decision to come to the conclusion that I've made today. Indeed, it saddens me to lose the service of a soldier who I've come to respect and admire. But the reasons that led me to this decision are the same principles that have supported the strength of our military and our nation since the founding. So once again, I thank General McChrystal for his enormous contributions to the security of this nation and to the success of our mission in Afghanistan.
and I would like to thank him, and I love him, and on his way out, I squeeze his ass just a little bit and say, it's okay, no, no big deal, man, no love lost, I love you, big guy. Okay, uh, but you know, I just, I had to do it, I guess. By the way, don't take me too seriously today. He did the right thing, okay? I, I'm just, I'm amused by his press conference. But, of course, he's got to say that as a politician. Don't get me wrong, okay? I'm just having some fun today. All right, now, look, when we come back, more fun. Turns out we have a secret recording of what Obama said to Petra. Uh, I'm sorry, to McChrystal. And, all right, what are the conservatives up to? What are they going to do now? All right, let's come back and tell you. All right, back on the Young Turks. More fun ahead. Yes. All right, the ladies from The View were discussing the whole BP disaster, and Obama said that we should pray and hope for things to get better. And, uh, look, we have the video, and it explains what everybody says. Some people were offended, like Janine Garofalo, at the fact that he said that we should pray. All right, let's check it out. And she said that the president was out of line for calling for prayer and uh, faith to help in the Gulf. It was, it's an amazing thing. Take a look at this clip. I didn't feel it was a strong speech, and I felt the, the, the prayer thing he did was pandering and anti-intellectual and just sort of a, a waste of time. When politicians use that prayer stuff, it is, it is anti-intellectual. It has nothing to do with what has happened. It has nothing to do with any real uh, way to solve a problem. You know, I, I don't know. I think, God forbid, day, what is this, 62. Right. Nothing is working in our human capacity. God forbid a bunch of people should come together and say, let's call on something that is beyond us to see if he can come in and help God with forbid. what's going right. on. Sherry. Yeah, you know, and I think, and, and it's okay if, if you think it's anti-intellectual, but for a lot of people, faith and prayer works. I think it's, I, yeah. well, I think it's day 64. Day 64. Day, Nothing day, is working. Yeah. Millions gushing out. Nothing well, is working. It shows be the that... only thing that can help this situation. So I think that that, that is on everybody's mind. Not, not to mention it's, it, that prayer is protected as in our freedoms of this country. Well, so the only problem is when... discrimination. Well, there's separation of church and state. Let's not but forget that. But is it discrimination to say to somebody, you're, an, you're not smart. In fact, you're dumb because well, see, you pray. that's the problem. She should have said unintellectual rather than anti to me. And that, to me, is bigotry. Well, unintellectual faith is something that you feel. Thinking is something that you do oh, with your brain. It's smart different. assessment. It's different. But, but you know, it's it's, different. No, it's not. It's, it's not a feeling. It's, a, people it's who not pray. a feeling. It's an I feel people like pray. people pray. And especially now that everything, what are you going to play to? Uh, let's see, who do I pray to? Tony right. Hayward of BP or God? Right. I pick God. It's just a question to me of when we pray. Uh, like, uh, there are countries that pray five times a day right. as a country. We pray when we get in trouble. Uh, whenever, like, to God, we must be that kid that calls every time he Whoa, needs some money. All the time. <laughs> right. Like, we, we, don't, we don't pray, and, like, every time, like, God must hear us and go, what happened now? Because... So why, not, why not do, like, a preemptive prayer? Right. Pray for alternative energy. Right. Right. That people, way you don't know what people are doing. People are doing preemptive prayers. The thing oh, about it, sure. you know, yeah, people are praying all, all of the time. Well, it's it's just you, you only hear about... When right, all right. So, yeah, people are praying all the time. How's that working out for them? Um, okay, now look, Garofalo shouldn't have said anti-intellectual because that sounds demeaning, etc. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they're clearly wrong. I mean, it, it's, and I feel bad saying that, right? But here, I, I'll bet you a billion dollars. Get everyone in the country to pray that the oil stops spilling into the Gulf of Mexico and don't do anything else. I, I guarantee you, I win the bet. It, God will not come down and go, oh, you know what? reach down with his invisible hand and go, oil, you will now stop. Okay, it, it just doesn't work that way. You know, it just, it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so, and then Elizabeth Hasbro put me over the top when she said, that's the only thing that can help. I know, I know, I know. No, no, pipes, machines, drills can help, okay? I don't even agree with uh, the Joy Behar. She said, you know, who, you know, it was a cute little line, and would I rather pray to God or pray to Hayward? Actually, who's more likely to stop it, Tony Hayward or God? As much as I dislike the guy, of course Tony Hayward's more likely to stop it. His company's the one that's working on trying to stop it. Now, they're not doing a very good job, but they're going to do a lot better job than if you just leave it and go, hey, God, you got this? You're on it? Okay, great, fantastic. No, it's, and then Hasselbeck was like, oh, it's not a feeling. You just, but it is, because you can't prove it. I, I'll, I'll let you have at it, Hoss. I'll let you pray to it 
you know, over and over with as many people as you like for as many days as you like, and it's not going to work. And uh, until, of course, like 17 years later, it finally stops because all the oil is out, right? And they'll be like, we told you. You see? God made it stop. Yeah, my only thought about this whole thing was that it was such a non-issue. It shouldn't have been brought up. Janine Garofalo shouldn't have said what she said. And then the ladies at The View shouldn't have had like a 20-minute discussion about it. It's a non-issue. Let's seriously focus on what we can do to stop it and what Obama hasn't been able to achieve yet in, in terms of this BP disaster. Let's not focus on him calling to prayer. Yeah, I mean, I, I see what you're saying because yeah. it, you're distracting people. Exactly. And, and as if like that's the real issue at hand. Did Obama pray too much? Did he pray too little? That's irrelevant. Exactly. What's relevant is what is he doing to stop the, the, uh, the spill in human terms, not in celestial terms. And, and you know what? If she hadn't thrown out the anti-intellectual line, which seems gratuitously insulting, right, uh, by Garofalo, uh, then, then I'm uh, with her because why did Obama m mention it? Of course he's pandering. You think Obama really thinks, oh, you know what? If we all pray together, it's going to stop. No, but he said it a couple of times at the end because he's a pandering politician. Keep it real. So, there you go. That's what we do. Next. All right, we have an update on Lawrence Taylor. Uh, last time we spoke about him, he was being accused of raping a 16-year-old girl. Well, it turns out that he's been indicted mm -hmm. uh, uh, on rape and sex abuse charges. Um, and if he is convicted, he could face four years in jail. So that, that doesn't make too much sense to me, right? Uh, raping a 16-year-old and you can get only four years maximum. But it turns out it's third-degree rape, patronizing a pro prostitute, uh, sexual abuse and criminal sexual act in the third degree, endangering the welfare of a child. So uh, the reason I bring that up is because they th that to me th says they think they might not have a lot on him. Mm -hmm. Like if they thought they had him nailed, you know, and they thought, okay, no, he... F forcibly raped her, or even if not, he knew she was 16. You don't even, he doesn't even have to know statutory. He doesn't even have to know that she's 16. But if they thought they had really good evidence, they'd have charged him with a maximum of 40, 50 years. Right, exactly. Do you see what I'm yes, saying? Yes, I do. So, and now apparently there might or might not be a witness who was in the cab yes. when the 16-year-old came out of the room. Uh, that witness says that uh, the 16-year-old said to her, oh, that was weird, we didn't even have sex. Right. Uh, the evidence includes sworn testimony by a 23-year-old woman who says uh, she accompanied the accused pimp and the 16-year-old girl in the hotel where Taylor was staying. She said Taylor did not rape the girl. The teenager returned to the car with $300 in her hand and said, that's weird, we did not have sex. Yeah, now uh, the other people say, prosecutors say, no, she wasn't there. So I don't know what's going on. Uh, but it, if, my reading of it is that they did something, but they didn't have sex. You see what I'm saying? They didn't have intercourse, mm -hmm. but they did some other sexual activity. Sodomy? <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to get into it. Uh, but either way, LT's in a lot of trouble, but, but it looks like from this that he might be able to, even if he gets jail time, it might not be that much. Okay? And, you know, look, to me, the bottom line on that is, did he know she was underage or not? If he didn't know, then I'm not sure he should get a lot of jail time. If he... It, maybe, if any, he was just using a prostitute. I don't think that should be illegal in the first place. Uh, but if he had any inclination that she was underage, then, yeah, that obviously put him away. All right, next. All right, ePoll Market Research uh, surveyed 1,100 people to find out who are the most disliked people in sports. Oh, now we're having mm, fun. So I have a list of athletes and uh, team owners for you that the public does not like. All right. Topping the list for the second year in a row is Michael Vick. You know, you kill a couple of dogs, you hang and electrocute a couple of dogs, and people are on your ass forever. When are we going to let this poor guy go? I'm waiting for JR to jump in. <laughs> no, no, I just spoke on behalf of JR. I was channeling JR Jackson there. Okay, now, of course, everybody gets it. And as they point out here, the reason that uh, Vic is the most hated is because uh, it got so much wide coverage. So it's not just NFL fans, uh, it's like non fans know him. And the only reason they know him is because he killed the dogs, and so they hate him. So that's why he gets big numbers. And that's why he's number one. <laughs> and when Vic heard the news, he was like, number one, baby! Okay, no, probably not. All right, what, what's, who's next? All right, coming in at number two is Al Davis, uh, the owner of the Raiders. Hey, Seuss, can I get a hell yeah on that? <laughs> Raider Nation! <laughs> Raider Nation. <laughs> but, you know, I, 
Hey, hey, Seuss, you're part of Raider Nation. Do, doesn't Raider Nation hate Al Davis? Yeah, we hate him. Yeah, so there you go. So he's jerking everybody around, L.A., Oakland, the Raider fans, etc. And how do you not hate a guy who gives that much money to Javon Walker? So, fair enough. Who's number three? Tiger, oh no, Ben Roethlisberger is at number three. Oh, that hurts. Mm. That hurts the big guy. Big man. <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> no, by the way, one of the reasons they said they hated him is not just because he was accused of the sexual assault, but because he was sh g shown on video passing out shots to everybody and acting like a frat boy. But I don't get that. I, I don't hate him for that. Have fun. Yeah, why not? If I was the Big Ben, I'd be doing shots too. I just wouldn't take my wanker out like he did to random girls. And be like, hello, hey, you want to see Big Ben? Okay, that was the real problem, not the shots. All right, who's four? Number four is Tiger Woods, which, which is surprising because you would think he would be higher up in the list considering all the drama he's been involved in in this year. Yeah, man, Al Davis has got to feel like, what? <laughs> I'm above Tiger Woods and ben, Big Ben? It's like, what did I do wrong? Other than screwing up a professional football team for decades on end. <laughs> All right, what's next? Number five is uh, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones. <laughs> Agreed. Who's six? <laughs> Number six is Mark McGuire from the St. Louis Cardinals. I love that because that guy, that guy got a free ride for so long, man, as those zits were popping like oh. fireworks out of his face and his head grew and grew and grew. And he's like, what, steroids? No way. I'm an American hero. So now that he's on the list, all right, now I feel better. All right. <laughs> Terrell Owens is at number seven. Of course. I was wondering when Terrell was going to come. As soon as I saw the headline, I was like, oh, Terrell Owens is on this list. Guaranteed. But why? Why do people hate him so much? Because he's a dick. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> okay. He hasn't committed any crimes or anything like that. He's just outrageous and flashy and, and rubs things in people's faces. Like 98% of all other celebrities? I hear you. And JR is going to defend him. Okay. But look, the guy's a jerk. Okay, he doesn't get along with his teammates. He thinks he's the king of the world. He's uh, emotionally I unstable. Picture. Yeah, I mean, he's a character. He's a character. I don't hate him. I think he's a, he's a crack up, but I know why people hate him. All right, coming in at number eight is Alex Rodriguez. Oh, good. Who I'm going to see on Saturday. Oh, please. I'm going to a game. Oh, you are? I am. Aren't you fancy pants? Okay. I'm excited, actually. I haven't right. been to a baseball game in like three, four years. All right. All You're right. not allowed to be excited. You're supposed to hate him. No, I, I kind of like Alex Rodriguez. No, I don't. You should, I kinda, so, look, I like looking at him, but I don't like who he is. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, by the way, you know, all these guys are hated because of steroids on, uh, in uh, baseball. And a friend of mine and I were talking about it this other day. So we're to assume that no one in basketball is on steroids, even the guys who are cut like crazy. Like when we find out 20 years from now or 10 years from now or five years from now, that Dwight Ho Howard was on Roy's, are we going to look back and go, duh, of course, those arms are the size of tree trunks, right? I don't know that he is. I have no idea, right? And maybe in basketball you don't need it, right? But it's like we get so mad at the baseball players, we don't even ask the question in basketball, that in football, I guarantee you every lineman is on Roy's. But we just give him a free pass. We're like, oh, I was sad I fucked him. But goddamn son of a bitch, Alex Rodriguez and Mark McGuire, I hate him, right? How about, how about Jonathan Ogden? How come he gets a free pass? Right, anyway, what's number nine and ten? Uh, Allen Iverson comes in at number nine. That's not right. Yeah, what's wrong with Allen Iverson? I, practice. No, I'm not. Practice? <laughs> okay. No, I know he's, again, he's a little flashy, a little controversial, but I think people are hating for, for not much reason there. Okay. Okay. And finally, at number 10 is Gilbert Arenas. No, hell no. That's where I draw the line. Gilbert's a good guy, man. Mm -hmm. he, he's a, he used to be on my man crush list. I love Gilbert Arenas. He's a guy. Okay, gun charge. Okay, so people are still upset about the gun charge. But like Ron Artest, he's totally misunderstood. Mm -hmm. He was goofing around. He didn't have bullets in the gun. Just calm down, okay? He's a good guy. He, sh he should be nowhere near this list. He should be on the top 10 favorite list. Is he on some fantasy team of yours, one use of money? So, th there's a backstory. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's just a funny guy. Everybody who plays with him loves him, right? And he's, he's wild, he's fun. It, he, you know why I like him and why he was on the man crush list and why I'm pissed at this? Because he has a zest for life. 
<laughs> Talk about flowery speaking. Okay, okay, but but he does, and you can see it in everything that he does, and and I appreciate that. He's trying to soak, you know, the marrow out of life, and I and, and I'm in favor of that. Carpe diem, Gilbert Arenas. I will not allow that list uh, him to be on that list. I think that's my favorite quote from you. He has a zest for life. I've never heard that before. Yes. Well, there you go. Okay. Try to surprise you every day. All right. What's next? All right, there was another study done uh, by the Harris Interactive, by Harris Interactive, and it's called uh, The Secret Lives of Teens. Hmm. And what it did is it asked about 955 teenagers uh, what they do on the Internet and how they interact with complete strangers, okay? okay can I guess this is uh, number one? Mm -hmm. Number one response, wank off. <laughs> oh, no, they didn't have that. No, in they that. didn't have that oh, in the okay. study. Uh -uh. Okay. But I like that your mind wandered off to that. <laughs> No, no, it's young kids. Are you kidding me? Young male teenagers? I'll tell you what the number one thing they do on the internet. And it doesn't take a genius to figure it out, and you don't have to do a poll on it. But anyway, go ahead. All right, so uh, what the study found is that teenagers are really bad when it comes to their own privacy. Mm -hmm. Okay, they basically give complete strangers all the possible information they can about themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me give you an example. The study found that 69% of the teens uh, shared their physical location. So mm -hmm. where they are, where mm -hmm. their house is. 28% mm -hmm. um, chatted with strangers, which isn't surprising at all. Um, of those who chatted with strangers, uh, they define, those are defined as people that they don't know outside of the online world. All right, 43 shared their first name, 43%. 24% shared their email addresses, 18% post photos of themselves, and 12% post their cell phone number. Well, I'll tell you what I mind and don't mind. Uh, I don't mind them sharing their first name. You know, uh, chatting with strangers, they're like, you know, would you do that in the street? No, because if some bitch might kidnap me into his van. But online, how's he going to kidnap me? So uh, chatting with strangers, I don't find that crazy, mm -hmm. okay? The one that uh, concerns me is the 18% post photos of themselves. Because that's only going to encourage the pervs out there, right? So there's going to be a bunch of pervy wankers trying to talk down to race people, try to get them their their pictures, right? And then if it works 18% of the time, they're just going to use the percentages. And it's not real life where you're going to get embarrassed. They're online. You're never going to see them, so they're not even embarrassed. You see what I'm saying? So if I had a kid that was a teenager, I'd be like, hey, listen, be a little careful, but don't get mental about, like, oh, my God, everybody's a stranger. It's okay to talk to strangers online. They're not going to jump out of the computer, right? Right. But don't give them your email address. Definitely don't give them your home address. And don't send them a picture because you don't know who it is. I'm going to tell them the same thing I tell the audience all the time. Like if you're a guy and you think you're about to hook up with somebody, it's a 43-year-old dude. And he's probably with the FBI, right? So, and if, so I would tell them that. And then second of all, I would say if you're sending someone your picture and mm -hmm. you don't know that person, you have to assume that they're going to do terrible things with it. Okay? So don't send pictures. Uh, you're right. And according to the study, uh, females are much more likely to give out their personal information to strangers than males are. So uh, You're only encouraging them. 32% females versus 24% males will talk to strangers online and share personal information with them. And that might be because there's more pervy wanker guys who are trying to reach more women. Right. You see what I'm saying? So that's why they get a higher percentage. And the guys try harder and harder and harder. Mm -hmm. Whereas how many women are knocking down the guys' doors? They'll be like, oh my God, how are you? I really want to chat with you. Some, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. Then there'll be, of course, the gay guys, but there's not as many of them as the straight guys. And then the final finding that I, uh, I found interesting was 62% routinely download files such as free movies, music, or pornography, which basically means that they're downloading or possibly downloading uh, viruses, especially with pornography. Yeah, who, who's still downloading porn? That's crazy, right? <laughs> I mean, that's like 1999 shit. Okay, I mean... That, that's so old school. No, I, I would never do that. That puts you in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, they, they, again, my assumption online is if you're downloading porn, it's coming attached with like 18 different alien bodies. You know, it's got viruses all over it and it's going to come on my computer. And then when I go to read stories every day, it's going to slow my computer down and it's going to drive me crazy. So, hell no on that. No, 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 no. You just watch it there. You don't download it. I mean, I mean, don't, don't download. <laughs> all right, I'm playing. Everybody calm down. We're done, right, with those? Okay, all right, here's what's happening. Uh, if you're queasy, you're going to have to be careful with our next story. Okay, we're going to take a break. When we come back, body parts are going to get moved around on a human being, 
and it's and it's going to be fascinating, but a little disturbing. Yes. Okay. We have pictures. We do have pictures. Come right back. Just like you. To relax my mind. So back on the Young Turks. Yet another interesting guest for you guys. Now we're going to talk to Johnny Knoxville. Uh, he was in the movies Dukes of Hazard, Lords of Dogtown, Walking Tall, and oh yeah, Jackass. Uh, he is also now the co-producer of the new movie, The Wild and Wonderful Whites of West Virginia. Johnny, welcome to the Young Turks. Thank you for having me on. All right, we appreciate it, man. So uh, tell us about The Whites of West Virginia. What is that? It's a portrait of this uh, uh, American family, uh, poor American family in Boone County, West Virginia. And they, they're, not, they're not dumb, but they're, they're uneducated. And they're very violent, and uh, a lot of uh, shooting, stabbings, pain pill snorting, and it's just a, a piece of uh, a, a American life that, like, a lot of people don't get to see and don't know that's out there. That's, how did you find him? How did the you know the filmmaker find him, and how did you wind up producing this uh, movie? Uh, I was a, I, I watched. There was a documentary called The Dance and Outlaw, Jessica White, The Dance and Outlaw, that came out almost 15, 20 years ago. And I, it was a really big hit, underground hit back home. It got passed around to uh, my family and friends. And you watched it like on a fifth generation VHS tape. And, uh, and I met, uh, out in Los Angeles, I actually met one of the, the guy who discovered Jessica and, uh, uh, was a uh, producer on the original documentary, and I was at, I, I went to lunch with him because I was such a huge fan, and we were talking, and I said, "What are the?" He said he had the, like five hours of footage never before seen, and that turned into us talking. Well, let's let's go see what their uh, Jess goes up to now, and and this is more of a portrait of the whole family. The first one was just on Jess Cole. And it was kind of cut just for joke, 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 and we wanted to really spend some time with. Jessica and the family and seeing what's happening in their life and that man it's a lot was happening so I mean are they admitting on tape I mean, I saw the trailer are they admitting on tape that they killed people uh, do, do people already know that are they already under arrest or or do they admit some things that they're not under arrest for uh, there's a lot of uh, you know there's shootings and stabbings and you know some 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 interviews are conducted in the uh, hospital you know, I mean, in the prison, and yeah, there has been, you know, some a lot of uh, deaths in the family, uh, most violent deaths, and it's it's just a really uh, intense, bizarre world. And I'm I'm talking a lot of, you know, it's a lot of like really shocking stuff, and there's a lot of sad, like really sad moments, like shockingly sad. But there's also there's also a, there's there's some really odd funny moments you know in the family and uh it's it's pretty so, unbelievable throwing to johnny knoxville uh, who co-produced the movie uh, the wild and wonderful whites of west virginia so johnny i mean what's the bottom line here what do you, why do you think they do it uh, i mean is it just are they scottish what is it <laughs> <laughs> um you know i just think that's the way they were raised, and that's the way they're raising their children, and that's the way their children are raised their children, and it just keeps repeating. Is it something in West Virginia? Is it in the water? What is it? No, I think, uh, you know, this happens all over the world, uh, this type of, uh, not, not to this uh, intensity or exactly like this, but, you know, there's little generational neglect happening everywhere. Right now, I hear you. All right, so you know, I want to ask about your career too. Uh, you originally came out to LA to uh, go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. How right. do you go from you know trying to be an I, an actor, a serious actor in LA, to being jackass? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I moved out. I just wanted an excuse to get out of Knoxville, and uh, yeah, I went there. I dropped out. It was a summer program. I dropped out and uh, just kind of wandered around Hollywood for a few years. Uh, and eventually started writing for magazines, and one of the magazines was Big Brother. It's a skateboarding mag. Who the editor was Jeff Tremaine, who was my partner, along with Spike Jones and Jackass, and that's kind of how Jackass started. From you know, 
uh, so, big brother on the West Coast and CKY videos on the East Coast. So you met Spike Jones through the magazines? Uh, no, I met Spike uh, through some other friends, but Jeff and Spike grew up together in Rockville, Maryland. So when we wanted to do a TV, Jeff and I were putting, you know, thinking about doing a TV show, we had a rough assembly of people we wanted to have on the show, like cast-wise, and then we called Spike and asked him, Jeff called Spike and asked him if he wanted to be involved, and Spike said, yeah. So uh, who came up with the idea to shoot yourself and to do the taser and the shot and the... Oh, the that was gun? my idea. That was your idea? Yeah, your that was... Uh, <laughs> I was actually, I was just writing that for Big Brother, just uh, writing the article, and Jeff, you know, before I went and shot it, he said, you know, you should film that too. And I said, well, send some money to film it for me, because I can't, I don't know how to operate those. And and he said he would, but the morning I went to pick up Dimitri, who's uh, been with Jackass for ever since then, he just handed me the camera inside the car and said, uh, here, you film it because <laughs> no one wanted to be associated with it at the time because that was way before Jackass. I was just for the skateboard mag. They were so, a little scared of what could happen if the bulletproof vest I bought wasn't very good. Yeah, I imagine so. So these like there's no, you're the original Jackass, right? I mean, you're the one who came up with this idea in the first place. Mm, I'm not the one who came up with the idea in the first place. I think came you know Jeff and me and Spike we. It, we we created the show, you know, together. Okay, I get. But people, but that, I mean, we were doing. Jeff was doing skateboard videos for Big Brother, and Bam was doing skateboard videos for CKY. So it it kind of came out of all that. So I don't, you know. I hear you, so Johnny. Do you ever get tired of the Jackass stuff? I mean, do you want do you want to get past that at all, or you're proud of it? I don't know, or mixed somewhere in between. Mm, no, I love it. I don't want to. I don't. Yeah, I'm not ashamed of it, or I, I. Yeah, that's me and my friends all created something, and they did pretty good, and we have a ball doing it. We're doing Jackass Three right now in 3D. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. boy, in 3D. Yeah. All right, you want to give us a little uh, tease of that? I mean, what? I mean, you've already done. I thought everything imaginable. What are you going to do to yourself in Jackass? Yeah, well, 3? it's nowhere close to clever. I can tell you that much. <laughs> and you're not going to be able to unsee a lot of these things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. There's there's two girls. There's cops. There's like madness going. No, on. no. We never really have girls. It's just a bunch of dudes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that's a great that's a great little tease. You won't be able to unsee it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're not kidding. So how about the production? Finally, on that stuff. So you you got into producing this because of that unique story that you told there. Do you think of doing more of that? And if you do that, is it just because I don't think people know how Hollywood works. Does that mean you put up some money for it and you get it back if it does well? How does all that stuff work? Well, you you know you don't you get someone else to put up the money for it. <laughs> oh, okay. that's producing. Uh, and yeah, we just uh, uh, we just produced uh, a documentary for ESPN uh, for the Thirty by Thirty series on Matt Hoffman, Jeff Tremaine, my partner. He directed it. And uh, we're really proud of it. It's uh, premiering on ESPN, I think, in uh, July. And it's uh, The Wild Whites and uh, The Birth of Big Air. The documentary on Matt Hoffman is available on a video on demand right now, I believe. All right. So let me, finally, let me ask you the qu absurd question I like to ask everybody in your position. Uh, how much did uh, doing the jacket stuff get you late? Hello? Yeah. How, get me what? Get you laid. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know uh, who wants to mess around with a bunch of fellas who uh, wear thongs and dive in poo. My guess is a lot of people. <laughs> Seriously, how'd that work out? Did you get a lot more girls after Jackass? Oh, no, no, no. All right, you're not telling me. Just a true. bunch of dudes wanting to arm wrestle. <laughs> All right, so I got you. That puts you in trouble. I got you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to leave that one alone. All right, Johnny Knoxville, the new movie is The Wild and Wonderful Whites of West Virginia, and it's a fascinating one. Thanks for joining us on TYT, man. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, buddy. All right. All right, uh, now we have a couple minutes left in the show, and I had promised earlier about the oil spill. I do. <laughs> it's a funny transition, uh, but we do have news on that. 
Uh, it turns out that uh, BP, as they were trying to fix things, you're going to be shocked to find out, uh, made it worse. Uh, they accidentally knocked a cap off. Now that it's been removed, and significantly more oil is spilling into the Gulf Coast. Woohoo! Win. Speaking of jackass, right? That's the, <laughs> there you go. There's your transition. Uh, and uh, according to the estimates, two and a half million gallons a day uh, are spilling into the Gulf now. Uh, that's on the worst case scenario side. Anywhere from 67 million to 127 million gallons of oil has spilled in to the Gulf Coast since the Gulf of Mexico, I should say, since uh, April 20th. Uh, and now Texas A&M University uh, Oceanic. Here I go again with this word. Let's try it. Slow. Oceanography professor. Still not great, but we got there. Uh, professor John Kessler uh, went and tested the methane in the water. He says it's anywhere between 100,000 to 1 million times more methane than is normally in the water. Fantastic. So that turns out uh, to deplete the levels of oxygen in the water, which greatly endangers the marine life. So what's happening is with all the methane in the water, it's sucking the oxygen out, and then the fish and all the different marine life uh, need that oxygen. They don't have it. That's one of the main problems. And in Louisiana, you know what? I, can we show it for the people who are watching the show, uh, the last clip? In Louisiana right now, it's raining oil. Uh, so let's take a look at that. And the same very brown, bubbly stuff we saw yesterday in the Gulf under the Bay St. Louis Bridge. So, you can see it. I mean, it's, it's raining oil. It, it is literally raining oil right here in River Ridge. All right, now, you, Very you heavy cut the volume on that. You, you, you can, can see it, and you can see the slick on the ground there. You can see it accumulating. The reason it does that is because, and this is the same reason it once rained frogs in Great Britain. This is a true story. Because the moisture and the water sometimes gets sucked up from the ocean, or, or in this case, the Gulf, and then gets dropped down in the form of rain. So once in a storm, uh, it, a bunch of frogs had gotten picked up and then dumped in Great Britain. In this case, it's happening on a much more systematic, uh, sy systemic way. Having troubles here with the words in the last second. Anyway, so that's why it's raining oil in Louisiana. Disaster. Young Turks.